hello hello ah it's a beautiful day here today sunday the we had a windy week uh today there's no wind obviously wind's good for power generating electricity but it's not as much fun to ride in the wind today it's a really nice riding day temperature is good not a cloud in the sky I'm gonna pass by this uh, traditional laundry place I was reading a Cara book about uh, Johnson Lyndon's Bain, Lyndon Baines Johnson and uh, he was a president during the Vietnam War in the 60s and Nixon took over uh, he came out of you know I mean Kennedy was assassinated um, anyway he was an interesting guy a very interesting guy and Cotta wrote three books on the man fucking <laughs> really uh, you learn a lot from those books but anyway yeah, I was thinking about the when I when I go by these uh, places where people used to wash their clothing you know they you dry everything in the Sun you wash everything by hand uh, the clothing is heavy <laughs> especially when it's wet and it takes a lot of muscle power and energy to carry the water carry the clothing wash everything so women were doing this constantly so they're washing clothing they're cooking dealing with food and children and housework <laughs> brutal hard work back in the olden days and uh, there's some really great descriptions of parts of Texas in the middle of nowhere Lone Star State where Lyndon Baines Johnson grew up very poor where women had to work like that that's one of the things that motivated him to do the Great Society civil rights work Try to help poor people. Um, and he brought electricity eventually. It took a long time to rural Texas. And you can imagine just how happy people were to have electricity. Now, there are trade offs. For everything obviously ah, speaking of washing hola bom dia bom dia <laughs> trabalhando <laughs> hard work <laughs> same Bon travail. Bon travail. Até logo. So you could see, I didn't want to bother the woman filming her washing, but you know, she's in the river washing clothing. And you can see her whole body's into it. It's a lot of physical labor, hard work. So, trade-offs, you know, you have a dictator or whatever, they do some good things, a powerful man, and uh, obviously, they also may be <laughs> very strict. You trade off a little bit of 
freedom and so on. So I think now uh, our particular economic system is in is going to change eventually due to circumstances. But anyway, right now the people who benefit most from it are doing everything to keep it intact uh, as long as possible, regardless of externalities or problems that it might cause a lot of people. Obviously, there's good arguments for why our system is great, brought people out of poverty. There's so many ways you can do it, the China way, the American way, the European way, whatever. But, you know, you're taking material from the earth and you're making stuff and selling it. That's the crux of the economy. Goods and services. You can talk about neo-mercantilism. We'll look at that from a historical point of view or not. Uh, whatever. There are limits to growth, I think. A certain kind of growth, there's limits to it. Anyway, we'll figure it out. But lately I was uh, reading up on CIA because I saw this podcast. And uh, then I was watching this TV show on uh, HBO. Where I, where I am, it's on HBO. It's called No Man's Land. And it's about a French guy who is looking for his sister and finds out she's uh, she's working for the, uh, sorry, the LPG, what's it called? I forgot. The Kurdish militia uh, in the border region of Turkey and Syria. And uh, really interesting show, but there's a handler, Stuart, his character, <laughs> brilliantly played, <laughs> who recruits assets and uses them for the big picture. And he's a spy handler, dude. <laughs> he's great. And it reminds me of everything that I was reading about the C how the CIA operates and what that uh, guy was saying on the podcast. I'm going to publish uh, a, a video, maybe today, tomorrow, on that. But he's so good. <laughs> the way he, you know, they have such detailed dossiers on these people, the targets that they want to recruit. And there's always some charming guy or girl who can push the right buttons and they, they know exactly what motivates these people. <laughs> and it's so clear in this, it's so well done. <laughs> the writers were, were totally well researched in those methods and so on. It's a cool show. Intense, brutal. And I was, you know, the Kurds are fighting the ISIS, right? So the Islamic State of Syria and Iraq. <laughs> and we have all these new wars and conflicts. So a new Cold War with China, which is just bullshit. It's just part of the crap to try to keep people in line, I think, to maintain global neoliberalism. There's no way we're going to fight a war with China. But anyway, uh, I've been, obviously I've been wrong about a lot of things, so we'll see. But anyhow, we have this grinding back and forth war of attrition in Ukraine. So we all forgot about ISIS. And they're still there, they're still a threat. They're still causing all kinds of trouble. And as America 
becomes weaker just due to circumstances if it doesn't make the, if you know American leadership and corporate power and so on don't make the right decisions uh, they'll be more vulnerable the terrorist thing isn't gone it never was it never will be and so but we don't think about it anymore because we're looking at AI now and all the culture war stuff, obviously. And new wars. Good old Sudan's back in the news. Forget about Yemen. Forget about Syria. But that's the way we are. Of course, none of us know anything about it anyway because we're just people. We're just people. Whew, man, this is nice. Nice countryside. I'll do a little round the town here. These nice trees. Oh boy, they sure do have a lot of doggies over here, don't they? Uh oh. I got a rock in my. A little pebble in me tire. Yes. <laughs> Cute dog. Hola, cachorro. Hola, 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 cachorro. Yeah, so it's nice to get out and burn a little bit of the sugars in my liver. <laughs> we went to a party in Turkel. And a lot of people, a lot of drinking. And some people take a hit of the old marijuana because it's legal, certain kinds, blah, 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 bought in certain ways. It doesn't mix with me. I can't have a bottle of wine and, and a joint. It just wrecks me. So yesterday was a write-off. I was so tired. Not going to do that again. That was fun though. Once in a while, a good party. It's what you need. Yeah, so just kind of making a road, a, a map of, of power, where, where the power is. You can study a lot about power, obviously, from lots of interesting sources, writers, like, you know, classics like Machiavelli and other things. But anyway, I was joking this morning. I said, I have a new friend, a new best friend, and he, she, it is really brilliant has encyclopedic knowledge, can talk to me about anything for as long as I want, any subject, teach me stuff I want to know, you know, have conversations about what I like to talk about to a certain level. Brilliant, just a brilliant friend. <laughs> you know what it is, right? It's like chat GDP and all these kind of things. It's amazing. And I can have conversations in Portuguese, so I don't even need to have a Portuguese partner to practice conversation. It's wild, man. And the old school uh, telephone dominatrixes in the old days, you know, they'd have a wealthy clientele and they'd tell these men what to do. And <laughs> the guys liked it because 
They have so much power and control, sometimes they just want to have a woman in control. So they hire these women and the woman might say, I'm not talking to you, I'm mad at you. Buy me a car and we'll talk. <laughs> so this one lady I was reading about, she, um, she does the same thing, but she made a, a virtual uh, person using these aggregating and int integrating these different um, tools and made a virtual uh, person like that. So you can pay a, d a dollar or two dollars, I forget what it was, a minute <laughs> to talk to this fake person, this deep fake. And she's used her image and body and everything to make the enhanced digital version, working on it, developing it. Pretty soon, you know, the, the AI will be able to take over developing it once you get it started. And you can literally just give it some prompts and improve it, work on it over time until it's a fairly good facsimile of yourself. And then that thing can work 24 seven, no insurance, no payroll, as long as you pay for the services you need to stream it. You just stick it on the server and it just, you know, a hundred guys could call in at the same time and talk to the same AI dominatrix. Okay, business idea, but you know, the cat's out of the bag now, so we, we already missed that one. But, but how can you make that technology uh, work for you in similar ways? That's what everybody's figuring out. So we used to have all those um, customer service centers in India and Philippines and other places. And now, of course, you're not going to need that at all, really. Uh, these, these AIs can easily provide you with the information you need to fix your computer or whatever the heck you, you're calling in for. And then if you do have a problem, it goes up the chain and you have to talk to somebody at the company, you know, obviously. Can do. But that's the way it's going. It's not the end of the world, but um, you know, you, you're gonna wanna think a little bit if you're young about how you're gonna fit into that business ecosystem, how you're gonna make yourself a value to supporting these machine learning and these AIs and whatever, how to be a good prompt person, you know, whatever. And I don't know. Other people who are, you know, professionals who are into, you know, following employment and all that kind of stuff, uh, they say a lot of new jobs are going to be created. Well, yeah, some for sure. A lot, I don't know. Maybe craftsmanship will make a comeback, building wooden dinghies or you know, uh, knitting sweaters, who knows. Oh dear. So today there's a hockey championship. It's roller roller uh, hockey, smaller uh, area than ice hockey, but it's really kind of fun. So this is the place. You can see here. So that's where the party was. <laughs> 
the party. Whoa. That's a really cool little bar there. It's a hockey club. Not hockey, it's jello, not ice hockey. Uh, what do they call it? Floor hockey? Hockey de champ? What's it called? See? So already people are here. It's early in the morning. This is the hockey rink. And I rink. Hockey Club du Turkel. So you can see, today's May 14, 5 o'clock final. So there's already people skating in there. Maybe they're getting warmed up. I think I'll just walk in real quick to show you. Maybe this is a preliminary thing. So, boys and, yeah, boys playing. I don't know if you can see this. I think I'll come back later with my cine camera and make a short video. Yeah, it's fun to watch. There you go. Painting the wall. You have to do a lot of surface maintenance on these places. These brick stucco homes. Not sure why I decided to ride down here today. Let's just have an easygoing ride after the Friday party. Man, when I was young, I could get over a party and the next day, <laughs> ready for another one. tired for 24 to 48 hours after a big party. If I indulge, probably shouldn't indulge. It's hard not to though, <laughs> for me. You just gotta pace yourself and know when to stop. For me. That's a huge house down there, man. I'm gonna show you this house because it's kind of cool.
I'm not using the battery now. I'm just cycling without the motor. So well, that's something else, isn't it? Look at that. This would be a great uh, film set or, you know, location for some movie where you wanted to have characters that were powerful. You'd have to clean it up a bit, decorate it, make it look more opulent. That's a nice gate. So many things to do. You get here, you like gates, walls, fences. It's a nice garden. Yeah, so I like looking at these little houses and gardens. How simple am I? So the grape leaves are back in fashion. There's a few wineries around here, a couple of organic ones. This road, I can go up over the hill. The view from up there is spectacular. Yeah, so people just can't seem to get over themselves. So we have to play these big grand games what I refer to always as the great game. And, you know, you're thinking of the great powers back in the day fighting over India, Afghanistan, Iraq, the Suez, Egypt. All the same kind of players, more or less, that we have now. Silk Road stuff. Ah, damn it. Who's that writer? He's an old, old geezer who actually did things during that time in the region, and he wrote a bunch of books. What's his name? Pretty cool. Books. <laughs> and you can imagine back then you're walking and riding a horse or a camel or whatever. Oh, Jesus. <laughs> yeah, in the middle of nowhere. I don't know how they did it, man. Anyway, you're fighting over resources so that you can make your luxury goods. Most, it's interesting to note that most of the stuff that you're fighting for, fighting over, um, I'll go this way. Uh, we're for luxury goods, you know, things that common people really couldn't afford. At, at the beginning, you know, the price of tea and of linen and of cotton stuff and whatever goes down over time. But then new things come out. It's just like today. 
you know at one point you they didn't have a smartphone in your price point now they do and you have to source the materials for, uh, for these goods globally you can't get all the raw materials to manufacture your stuff in England well, if you're manufacturing in England you gotta bring in raw materials and obviously as we know export value add products and that was a big deal so you have to send your armies and private armies and corporations and you know it's like extra state <laughs> in some cases not the state but the the corporation from the state you know the organization East India Company or whatever and you have to it's almost like the CIA handler you have to convince the people that you're more or less robbing <laughs> that that a certain c cohort or a segment of that population is going to get a good deal from the colonial power and their their businesses so that they help you control the population because you can't you can't send enough soldiers from England with their allies to India to secure the whole, whole country you have to have uh, allies in in the country that can help you and then you pull all the stuff in and make value add you know in the old days they buy China from China and they loved it it was a luxury good you know the common people didn't have that and then of course they figured out how to do it so you have Waterford crystal now and all that kind of thing and still you might need some things from abroad to come up with the pigments that you paint the plate with or whatever you come up with new techniques based on energy supplies that you have that they might not have then you start mass production you know the drill you know the story and we're still doing all that today we tend to think we're not because the neoliberal thing is so pervasive that we kind of just take it as part of nature you know the world's always been a platonic world or the world's always been scientific actually the pre-socratics were all scientific people just like the scientists today they just didn't know it <laughs> people argue that kind of garbage all the time but uh, there's a nice dog ready to roll So we're going to continue along this path uh, I guess forever and hope that it all just somehow works out due to good technocratic leadership you know science innovation technology engineering blah 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 and all the private enterprises deregulated and depending on investments involving derivatives <laughs> that it just it's all so crazy to me but anyway he's going to sort everything out and you and i we don't have to worry about anything just shut the fuck up and enjoy the ufc man the fights last night were pretty damn good they were they were good good fights exciting competitive but yeah, and they all, hardly any of them went the whole five rounds or three rounds. Bunch of tough guys kicking booty.
shut up and enjoy your computer, your phone, your whatever. Fun stuff, computer games, video games. Show got a video. Shut the fuck up. <laughs> Relax, enjoy. At some point, you know, like, you know, Amazon decides it doesn't need to have free delivery anymore, so we're going to deliver to a center somewhere, you know, they have all these places that will receive packages. And I don't know what I'm doing on this road. Anyway. And you can, you can drive over and pick, pick it up from that small business print shop or whatever. And if you want it to be delivered to your door, we're going to charge more. Maybe that makes sense because, you know, and maybe it saves carbon emissions. Who knows? But it's going to cost you. What's going to happen to fast fashion? when Bangladesh and Vietnam and a lot of places where they put together clothing are in a wet bulb uh, state where the te temperatures are so high that human beings, you know, die. They, they can't really live. You know, uh, how are they going to uh, cool the workspaces? So there's going to have to be innovation there just uh, you know air conditioning innovation and people are gonna have a hard time living there so where are they gonna go so then you have to move your you know you want to make billions of t-shirts because you need scale to make money when you're selling things for practically nothing Everybody needs a new t-shirt every day. Whoa. I don't want to be on this road. So things will just shift and it will be imperceptible to us unless you're paying attention, reading all the magazines, Financial Times, Bloomberg, and many, many others from around the world. Consultants uh, product. You know, they publish a lot of information and you're, you're keeping up on all this stuff you, because maybe you're an investor, a strategic investor like Ray Dalio or whatever. And so you'll, you'll be aware of what's going on, man. Oh, I can't get off this road. They have ovens there and dog houses, cuisine stuff. So all these things will change, right? Services will shift. You'll have your smartphones and apps and chips and whatever, AIs. People will be able to know people, you know, people in charge of things who need data and information to maintain power and to make money, they'll know everything you do. All the time. So, wow. Whew. Why am I here? Why? Kind of want to go over there, but then again, maybe not. Jesus. It's getting kind of late. It's a chicken curry day. Lovely. So we won't know when they decide they. <laughs> what a... I, I, my, my pronoun is they. 
when people in power and control doing business they decide that it's really important to know what you're doing 24 7 to know exactly how you're spending your money all the time and to know uh, you know how much you breathe all your biometrics even having to do with your heart rate and everything <laughs> insurance companies and act actuaries will need to know all this stuff to keep the game going of course they, they will adapt very quickly because big business leaders and so on they're strategic they have more information than we do and so they're going to make strategic decisions for their businesses and it has nothing to do with your welfare if they can convince you to buy something which is pretty damn easy uh, the guy said the CIA guy said something like human beings are laughingly laugh, laughably predictable you know we're just so easy to play and to program so they businesses will be able to convince you to buy goods and services and you'll think it's vital to your identity and your status and your happiness and well-being and so on there's a sucker born every minute and we're not really deep th thinkers uh, a lot of us not a lot of us are obviously but so they'll they'll figure shit out they have they'll crunch the data i i read that book kahneman book noise which is a companion to thinking fast and slow and one uh focuses on uh biases and heuristics and this one focuses on noise noise is different and so it impacts decision making in a big way and so you have to be able to identify noise and deal with it quickly so that you can make good decisions and of course all of this is in service of big business because uh, they're the client so the client of CIA product is the government and other strategic businesses and so on that it's important to that they need to know right need to know basis so we tend to think that we don't that our government US government doesn't or the European government doesn't support big business but it does tax breaks incentives and other kinds of uh, money flowing in you know because they feel it's strategically important for the security of the United States that these businesses are supported which is why oil and gas has always been subsidized by the government the taxpayer or the central bank the, the bankers that you know quote unquote print the money might as well just say that you know it puts the money on the ledgers in the compute computer so yeah those folks are need to know folks capella oh, there's something down there i'm not gonna go down there though I'm not I've done this one before I'm not not fit for it today so yeah these are decided by the security uh, agencies there's so many in the states as well as the government different committees and so on and the executive whatever and they decide what they're going to support and how they decide what they're going to support is you know something that's interesting to learn about if you're interested in it so uh, if you if you're a president you get elected to save the people like bernie sanders or something you're not going to be doing what you said you were going to do 
because the executive will be captive of business interests and other interests and agencies, just the momentum, the uh, inertia in the system. And they'll shift their worldview very quickly and realize that, yeah, we need to uh, subsidize oil and gas and the arms industry and whatnot. It's very important to the security of the United States of New Miracles. And uh, that's the way it goes. Woo, very nice. That's a cool little paint job. Right there. Yeah, so what do I do? Go keep, continue going up or wind my way back around and down? See, this goes all the way up over the hill. I, if I had an extra battery, this is a beautiful trip. You can ride towards Battaglia, it's very nice. So, but you ride towards Battaglia on the top of that hill, Mont Serra, and uh, pretty nice. So they, they get, they get co-opted pretty quick. They all do. And also, like I've said many times before, you can imagine what it's like once you're in the halls of power uh, with all the nice people and the nice lunches and the offices and the staff, people who are there to wait on you and cater to you. And you, you feel you have power, but you may have less power than you think but you think you're pretty powerful and it's so exciting being in the club. And the last thing you want to do is give up your membership to the club. So you, you fall in line pretty quick. So in other forms of government where there are lots of different parties and different branches and there's a prime minister and a president and all this kind of stuff, sometimes smaller constituencies can get things done. So this is a quarry, quarry. It's kind of interesting to see all of the blocks. Blocks for sale. Real blocks, people. It's the big boy's blocks, not the child's blocks. You got child's blocks and you got big boy blocks. Check this out, man. You want to have some blocks? Build a foundation? Stop the, the ground from sliding. Woo wee! That's some blocks, baby. Nice. And you wonder, man, all the centuries that <laughs> they've been taking blocks out of the ground around here, and <laughs> they still do it. So yeah, there are a lot of blocks in the on the earth. <laughs> Other resources are less uh, available. <laughs> Yeah, it's fun to look at resources and just think, you know, how much do we have and stuff like that. Of course, if you're a neoliberal servant, then you're going to have to believe that everything's going to be all right and that we have plenty of stuff to grow 3% a year GDP forever, you know, or at least until my grandchildren die. <laughs> we Westerners can't think beyond like grandchildren. If if that, less people are, people are having fewer babies and whatnot. So maybe it's even fewer people. People can only think to you know sixty years. <laughs> if that, you know what was I doing at twenty five thirty? Was I really strategically planning? to live to be 80. <laughs> People who have a salary job, they're lucky because they don't, they, they're kind of safe in the old days if they do their job well. And so they can count on their salaries, their investments, and just watch it grow over time and, and retire at some point. And that's that, that's the life. 
But if you live a more precarious existence like I had, you know, a boomer bust, you don't know. You could be sitting pretty around the next corner or you could be dead. <laughs> and there's never enough if you, if you think you're going to live till 80. <laughs> I have friends in their 80s. Oh my God. I'm 65. And shit. What am I going to do? How long is this going to last? Relatively feeling young and curious and stuff. This is nice. I like it. Yeah, that winds up through the pass there. Very nice. How long have I been out here? The sun is strong. This is a nice place to ride around. But I don't have time to go up. And I'll run out of power. And I'm far away. But it just starts to get lovely and interesting. So when I come out here, I really want to have an extra battery. It's heavy, but just extend the range so I can cycle in the really beautiful areas where there, there are few people Yeah, it's so nice. And I don't, I'm not the type that puts the bike on the car and rides some, drive somewhere and then. Nice coasting down, very relaxing. Yeah, so under current conditions, uh, we, we stay the course, who knows for how long, and see what happens. But we're gonna have problems just like in the old days when they were playing the great game, but they didn't have billions of people on the planet at that time. They didn't have these migrant uh, problems that are only gonna get worse because of, uh, shit. Because of, yeah, climate change is gonna make it worse. because you'll have to fish in uh, different areas and you'll have to farm in different areas and, and food production is going to be done differently. I don't know, maybe somehow desalinization becomes cheaper and you're building these vertical farms. People talked a lot about that for a long time and then it just disappeared. So aquaculture, aeroponics, uh, all these different things, ways of growing, whatever. But I guess you still can't grow grains at scale, rice and wheat and barley and all that kind of stuff, millet, in a warehouse. 
and you know soil erosion and all that kind of stuff so around here you wouldn't think we'd ever be out of food because of the way it is and people have been farming here since before Romans came right but there weren't a billion eight billion mouths to feed right so that's the difference so when you have hordes of people migrating because they have to basically it's just their will to survive that's making them leave their homes so the great game continues you have to control that somehow diplomacy and war and big business and uh, security agencies all that shit how do you control it this border situation in the states it is a problem and uh, you know they they talk about it and feud about it for decades and they don't do shit really nothing ever happens so the system has to be reformed the structures, everything has to be re-engineered, I guess, somehow to make the immigration system better. They never actually get it done. Maybe it's improved a bit, I don't know. But you're gonna have hordes and hordes of people. And then if you wanna know the cause of that, you can look back, Schmedley, Gangster capitalism. You can look back in, in history for reasons why uh, countries haven't found their own way to live in peace and harmony within their own borders. <laughs> you know, most nation state borders are kind of arbitrary, but there's pre legal precedent, they exist, they're there for a long time. You have Guatemala, you have El Salvador, you have Nicaragua. And, you know, if, if you just kind of left them to their own devices, but again, you know, you have big business and they need stuff from those countries. There's a labor arbitrage or they need some agricultural product or something else. That's why they have, you know, you talk about the Banana Republic and this kind of thing. So now Haiti's in big trouble. Does that spill over into the Dominican Republic or not? And obviously it doesn't seem like uh, America wants anything from Haiti anymore, but they'll still mess around with it. It's pretty much a wrecked country. And uh, deforestation and everything, you know, it started a long time ago. Who's to blame? A lot of different things. It's never one thing. It's never one person, one administration. Uh, a lot of things were going on. But we're not deep enough human beings to consider all of these different factors and think multidimensionally and look at second order and third order effects. And we, we're not really concerned about the well-being of people that much. It's all lip service. And you can throw, you have a lot of money, you print a lot of money, you can throw some money and say, look at what we did. We gave some families uh, mosquito nets, which is nice. But, you know, what, what, are, what are the other problems contribute to malaria, poverty, population issues, economic and so on. So yeah, it helps to keep some people. But do, how much does the mosquito net really matter? I, I don't know. Maybe a lot, I don't know. But thanks, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. That was very nice. Then they come up with a vaccine and you have people just angry as hell about that. <laughs> yeah. 
turning them all into zombies. It's not a malaria vaccine. Yeah. So I got to decide how I want to go back. I just think I'll, yeah, I'll go back like this, over this hill. A nice gas station with a cafe. Jehovah's Witnesses. Or maybe uh, Latter day Saints. Or maybe not. Latter day in the park. I think it was the 4th of July. Latter day in the park I think it was the 4th of July He didn't know that was a religious cult song Did ya? So we can't seem to think our way out of it, although there are lots of economists and thinkers that are working on different ways of doing things, it, it'll never catch on because uh, in the small cliques and bubbles and silos where people think like this, they have no power and they don't know how to get power. And there's so much fragmentation that people can't work together. And now we're all on our phones all the time, so we don't know how to create relationships and work through hardships together because we can get everything from our smart devices. Why do we need to go through all the trouble of having a relationship with another human being? A team, you know, you, you have to pay me. You know, give me a raise and I'll do it. You gotta pay me, bro, to deal with messy, dirty, stinky human beings. Dirty, stinky, messy humans. Dirty. That's a nice little cafe. I wonder if I should go up that way. Yeah, why not? Turn left, turn right, it's all good. So we're gonna be living like this for the duration. And then year by year we can look at things, see how they're going and, and ignore, ignore anything that's uncomfortable, which is what we, we learned how to do we're very excellent, good at it, professional at ignoring things that we don't like. And we have more stuff, you know, we can microdose and whatnot so we can feel good. There's all so many more ways to feel good, all kinds of ways which is nice. So basically, it's the best time to be alive in the history of humanity if you're living in a wealthy, secure country. Western Europe is pretty good. The Estados Unidos is pretty good if you're not poor. You know, there's tons of rich people there. 
Japan has its social problems, so does South Korea, but you know, it's okay. They, they, they know how to live in their world. How to be happy. I'm sure they still go out and drink shochu and eat yakitori, and that's all good. And my friends live in Thailand. It's a nice country, very nice. They got plenty of problems, but you don't notice it. Sabai, sabai. Everything's good. Good food. You don't want to be in Yemen, you don't want to be in Libya, you don't want to be in Syria now, you don't want to be in these places. You don't want to be in Eastern Ukraine. But, you know, so many other places are pretty nice. Even relatively poor countries like this one. So poor. So poor. So simple. But, it's nice. It's not as fancy as parts of the United States. And, you know, you're not powerful. They were talking about we united after 911. It was such a great feeling. Yeah, so it takes a horrific disaster to unite Americans. Then I'm watching UFC last night and I'm like saying, every time you see the USA, that you know, there's an American fighter against a Brazilian fighter, a Russian fighter, somebody from abroad, an Irish guy, and they're saying, USA, USA. So, you know, it's not true. I mean, you don't need a big disaster. You just need an American guy fighting a Polish dude, and you're fine. Because, you know, USA, USA. So there may be libtards in the audience, conservatives, Trump forever people, but they all are happy because they like UFC, Ultimate Fighting Challenge, MMA, boxy. They like the violence, the competition, the drama. So, yeah, it doesn't take that much to unite the country. All that people in Carolina, Charlottesville or wherever it was, Carolina, they sold out stadium of people united in their love of... Ooh, See? When the weather's good and you get this shit going on. They're all united. And you read about, I was reading about India being more open to LGBTQ now and same-sex marriage. So it's amazing. That's in India, for God's sake. <laughs> but how much of that is so, I don't know. But it's funny, you know, all we need is a good war, like a new Cold War with China, so we can just make everyone scared to death that tomorrow they're going to be storming, storming the beaches of. Uh, <laughs> wherever, you know, Qingdao or something, and uh, get everyone worked up and scared, even though we still buy everything from <laughs> China, DJI, and uh, we do so much business, they own so much American currency, USD, and treasuries, ridiculous. The neoliberals aren't going to go to war with China. They need China. They do good business. But they need people to be afraid because that's the way you unite Americans. You got to unite them. Unite them. They have to be afraid. There has to be a war on something. So the war on drugs is kind of played out and the war on terrorism is kind of played out. So now we, we get to Britain sent a bunch of long-range missiles to Ukraine with depleted uranium munitions. 
that are really nasty, <laughs> hard to clean up after the war, impossible. But anyway, whatever, got to kill some Russians. And so <laughs> we're all excited about this stuff. And unite, everybody has to put a Ukrainian flag on their social media. Pick a side, motherfucker. Tucker Carlson, that goddamn traitor. <laughs> he tried to have a nuanced view. <laughs> yeah, right. So, we'll have our, you know, things to unite America. And look at Biden and Trump and Obama. They all had the same approach to immigration. <laughs> There's no difference. It's just rhetorical. It's just emotional stuff to excite the people who are fairly ignorant. And I mean that just they don't know about the nuances of these things and the complexities involved and whatnot. But it sounds good, build the wall. That I can get behind because that sounds good. You know, you have a wall, they can't get in. There's a castle and a moat. You're secure. And then the same guys will be pissed off because there's an app on their phone and somebody's telling them to get a, a vaccination or whatever, you know? So, yeah, there's going to be digital currency for sure. And whether or not all the crypto stuff is going to provide freedom for people is another story. I know it's easy, to, it can be done to move money around with crypto, but at the end of the day, you're turning it into euro or yen or whatever to buy things. And then those transactions are always clocked. You don't just sell a shitload of Bitcoin. Well, you ought to understand, I bought a thousand when they, when they cost a dollar each. I spent a thousand bucks. Now they're worth millions, so I'm gonna buy a house. The bank's going, where the fuck did you get that <laughs> money? <laughs> the tax man, everybody's gonna know. And then you have to have a story some way to more or less prove or make them believe that you've had Bitcoin since 2010. Anyway, the bottom line is they're going to control all of that because they have to, to keep the game going. It's a great game. And we will, we will not have a choice. I mean, once the digital currency comes out, it's just going to be what it is. You won't be able to buy anything with a dollar, you know? That goes away. Someday you'll wake up in the morning and that goes away. The cash in your pocket is gone. So you pay through your phone or some other thing, period. And then what they do about privacy and encryption and security, that's all a, another big topic. So, uh, does the government have the right to know how you spend every penny or are they going to create laws that give people with money a little more privacy with their with their assets and resources you know at the end of the day we all pay taxes property taxes and we pay for insurance and everything all of this stuff is tracked it can all be looked at Companies know a lot more about you and you don't even realize that you have the right to call your insurance company and find out all the information pertaining to your medical case and they have to give it to you. But since you don't know, since you, since, since you don't know about that, uh, Since you don't know about your right to do that, because we don't read the fine print in our user agreements and contracts, uh, you know, you just let things slide. Think of all the money you've lost over the years because of things like that. Lots. 
so how much control do you have? I don't know. And pe friends of mine say, we got to keep fighting. We got to keep swinging, you know, whatever. Yeah, but what are you doing? You're shadow boxing in your bedroom, looking at yourself on a mirror or videotaping yourself, shadow boxing. You, you actually have, have nothing unless somehow you're charismatic enough to put together a civil rights movement like Martin Luther King and his people did. And you think about all the work the guy did in his 30s, full-time job, give up everything. And you run that thing. If you're like a lot of thinkers, you're never going to do that. You're selling product, intelligence product, basically, to corporations so you can make a good living. And then you're going on podcasts and talking about your product. <laughs> and uh, yeah, it's free. But people like Peter Joseph or something who really had some ideas back in the day that people have co-opted, but they never give him credit because he's an artist. He didn't ste step up, take responsibility for the movement. It's just, a, it's just a thing. And people can do whatever they want with it, you know? It's like the Game B thing. It's just a thing. All of my people on my Game B platform can do whatever they want. Good luck. And what do you see happening? How many DAOs do you see being developed? I don't know. What, do you know? In the States, decentralized autonomous organizations, how autonomous are they? Do they have to uh, obey the laws of Wyoming or Florida? And are those laws subject to change on a whim? based on what player, what politician the, the players want to have in office at a given time. <laughs> so, I don't know, man. Still got to pay your taxes. Oh, what the heck is that? Oh my God. This is the Turkel. Uh, market. Sweet. Very sweet. I like it. Ah, oh, so this is kind of nice. I'm going to take a picture. I wasn't aware of this Sunday market, so I'm going to take a pic. Yeah. Different ratio. How about video style? So that's pretty nice. Yeah, so they have markets all over the place. So Monday has a market in Caldas. It's a big one. Those are nice succulents. I like succulents. They got some chapelles. Oh, muito bom. Chapelles. Got some bags. Oh, I need another bag like this because mine's falling apart. Seven euro. Stop recording. So I got stuck in shopping mode because of my bag is breaking. I was going to get another one, but they're a little too, too cheap. The quality is not so good. So something like this, but yeah, the inside of them isn't very good. It just seems like something would rip. If I put something in it, it might rip the interior of the bag. 
So it's seven euro cheap, but probably too cheap. You buy cheap stuff and it just turns into garbage. So here's eggs and everything. Wow, that's nice. Spuds. Oh, this is a good market. Very good. So it's nice to have all these markets. That's a cool little place. Wow. Stop recording. Yes, yeah, there's a good sandwich place down there. I've had this bag I'm using while I'm riding. It's a little bag I throw over my shoulder, across my chest. For years. But yeah, I had I you know I bought I bought a bag in Japan like in 2000 or something. <laughs> and it's in perfect condition. And I've gone all over the world with it. I mean, it's just built well. And these days they don't make things to last anymore cuz that's not the business model. I often thought that it would be cool if some people would uh, develop some businesses that are based on... <laughs> I don't know how you'd make it, but... You know, you, you sell them a pair of shoes that are going to last for decades and you promise to... Re you, you have repairing uh, service. Hello. Oh, I was just riding through Turkel and there's a little market here with food and succulents and a little place where you can eat. It's pretty nice. <laughs> I'd never noticed it before. Yeah, it's a Sunday market. It's kind of not far from uh, Pingo Dos, but it's on one of those little side streets. Yeah, so anyway, never mind. I'll be back. Uh-huh. Oh, cool. All right, I'm on my way. Whew. Yeah, busy road. Bom dia. Yeah, there's less uh, violent, angry testosterone in this country, which I very much appreciate. Everybody doesn't have murderous thoughts, you know, anger, hate, <laughs> much less. But yeah, I was thinking it'd be so nice to have a business where, you know, uh, you'll, you'll, you pay to have it repaired in the future, but that thing's going to last. So let's say you buy a pair of shoes for $30. Well, you're going to pay $150. But they're the kind of shoes that you don't have to worry too much about fashion. And they're brilliant shoes. and <laughs> They last forever. And for very little money, you can have them repaired or whatever, you know. I mean, in the old days, you know, I used to wear the same jeans every day for a year until they wore out. And, you know, you have a good jacket that really works, fits well. Obviously, you get fat, whatever, you have to get another jacket. But just the 
bringing quality back into the equation and make it, making it accessible to people. Uh, if people understood that um, making garbage really doesn't save them money. Making garbage isn't isn't gonna save you money. You know, you can go buy some cheap thing right now, just, you know, looking, I mean, I've been looking for a bag to replace this one. Haven't found one. Stop, look again. No, it's too cheap. It's not worth it. It, it kind of bugs me, you know, when I see all of us making so much garbage, you know. Buying stuff that we're going to throw away that's going to break. But, you know, you know, the whole business model with China was about various types of arbitrage and producing things cheaper at, at big scale so that you could, you know, populate the big, big stores, Wal Walmart and so on, with tons and tons and tons. And you need a great logistics system to do that. You know, the whole container thing was a big deal, having those containers. Obviously, IT helped a lot with logistics. All of these things have to come together to make it possible to ship a whole bunch of raw materials to one place, have them manufactured, ship them to another place where more value is added and then uh, ship them to retail stores. <laughs> I mean, think of it, it's amazing. And you couldn't do this without oil and gas, obviously. So if there ever comes a time when so-called peak oil becomes a problem, and you know, if there, what do you have, nuclear powered, shipping container ships <laughs> a certain amount of globalism can't be uh, avoided if you want to live fairly well like we're used to but I'm, I'm guessing that we're gonna be a, a mixed a, 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 a different kind of mix of local and global products and services material flows and energy consumption. So when all my conspiracy friends hate green energy and stuff, they think uh, climate change is just a con job, you know. Uh, they don't want to look at the science. They could care less. They just don't like it. So then you read these reports about how much energy has been gotten, has come from wind power and solar power in the UK. And it's just going up. But then you do all the numbers about materials and, you know, the total life cycle assessment. And obviously it's not perfect. So you have to weigh, weigh it, you know. Uh, is, it, is it better in the long run to do it that way? And then you have to fight about it for decades. Turn it into a culture war issue. For decades. Um, so then they talk about command and control economies and so on. If you study China, the Chinese system, you know, what can you get done? Obviously, if they decide to build high-speed rail, they build high-speed rail, period. <laughs> Not like in the States. I've seen China develop since 1980 with my own eyes. My own eyes. And I think people who've never left Arkansas or wherever would, couldn't, couldn't fathom it. Okay. 
so the Belt and Road, whatever. Different way of doing things. America relies on a huge military budget and lots of facilities. So with all the national security agencies in the United States, how secure is it? If they didn't have all of those, would, would uh, there have been a 911 every year? I don't know. Maybe not. But all of those agencies need a budget and they all love their budgets and they love their jobs, obviously. So, kind of hard to get rid of it. Is Are there other ways to be safe and secure besides that way? Well, we're, we'll, we'll find out. Maybe, maybe there's no other way. So who knows? How do you how do you get rid of nuclear weapons when you have to have another Cold War? Everybody's pulling out of treaties. People don't trust international law. Instead, you have this vague rules-based order thing. I shouldn't even think about this shit. I should concentrate on writing theater of the absurd. Little weird comedies. <laughs> why why bother thinking? You know when you when you think about the market for books and I buy